Oh, hey, how you guys doing today? Good, yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, as you guys know, my name is Rob Christian. Uh, I've been into reptiles for most of my life, and today I'm here to talk to you about blood and short tail pythons. I'd like to think that they're one of the more uh, underappreciated and kind of villainized of the python species. A lot of people see them and they're like, oh, those out for blood pythons is what I've heard most of the time. Um, what a lot of people don't know is they're actually broken down into three species now. Uh, in 2000, uh, the blood python, python brongersmi, were granted as their own species as opposed to before uh, 2000. They were all part of the python curtis. Uh, so the short tail was all grouped together. And it was, they were classified as uh, python curtis brongersmi was the red blood pythons. Uh, python curtis Breitensteini was the Borneo short tail pythons. And then python curtis curtis was the Sumatran short tail pythons. Um, but then 2000, the blood pythons were separated into their own species, and 2001, uh, Borneo short tail pythons were granted into their own species. So only just recently were they actually they found genetic information to decisively say that they are their own separate species, even though they come from different islands. Well, Borneos come from completely different islands, and then uh, Sumatra short tails can be found in some of the same areas as the red blood pythons. So. I'm going to be talking to you guys today a lot about the differences and then the captive care and the, a lot of the, try to dispel some of the myths about blood pythons and short-tailed pythons. So, uh, this is just a side profile of the three species and one of the main things that is helpful when determining a blood python as opposed to some of the short-tails is that the Borneo short-tailed pythons have what are called subocular granular scales which are a small line of scales that'll separate the labial pits, the pits, uh, sorry, the uh, scales along the mouth and the eye. So if there's usually a question between some of the snakes, they usually look for those granular subocular scales. And then also there's a difference between ventral scale counts between the short tails and the uh, red blood pythons. Uh, red blood pythons will have a ventral scale count of 167 or over, and then the two uh, Borneo short tails and Sumatran short tails will have a lower count, usually less than 166. Uh, that's usually for the people who are really old school and want to make sure that everything's pure and came from the right places and wasn't crossbred and things like that. Um, but what, the main differences you can tell: Sumatran short tails are also known as black blood pythons. The ones at the bottom right there. I don't know, can you go back a slide? Alright. Uh, the Sumatran short tails are the black blood pythons. And they generally start out like a dark silver and black coloration. And then as they mature, they gain a lot of the black. Uh, some of the ones that are considered a little less desirable, but still very cool looking, uh, will have browns in there instead of the black color. And there's also a locality that's from, I want to say, the northwest side of Sumatra that has a peach-headed coloration. So it would look almost like a Borneo short-tailed python, but it will have a black, black body. And uh, I'm going to get into that a little bit later on in the presentation, but you guys can see that. And then with the blood pythons, you can see they kind of have like a darkish colored head. When they're young, they'll have a sort of a brown base color. And then they'll have like silver markings. And they only get a lot of black towards the very end of their tail. They generally don't have a lot of black in the rest of their body. Uh, with the Borneo short tails, they'll have a brown base coat, like a base coloring or like a brown black. And they'll have the silver markings, and then the black and white in the tail is a lot more pronounced than you'd see in the red blood pythons. And with the red blood pythons, there's usually more of a yellow color in the patterning. And with the Borneo short tails, you have silver or white. Uh, when they're younger, it's a lot harder to tell between the three, or it's hard to tell between the blood pythons mostly, the blood pythons and the Borneo short tails. Uh, but as they get older, it becomes more apparent. It's pretty easy to tell once they start getting older. But, and one more. Uh, this is just some of my background. Uh, I've been into snakes for as long as I can remember. My mom has actually been keeping tarantulas for over 30 years. So I was originally into tarantulas, and then I'd go out looking for, for uh, spiders and things in my yard. And eventually I'd start finding salamanders and start seeing garter snakes in my yard. So I got really into snakes. It's kind of bad for my dad. My dad's terrified of snakes. <laughs> so it actually took me 14 years for me to convince him to let me get snakes. I was never allowed to keep snakes as a kid. Um, and I've been subscribed to Reptiles Magazine since 1994-ish. 
So when I was five years old, I already knew that I wanted to work with snakes, and seeing animals in the different magazines and things really got me into trying to find out as much as I could about them. And I remember when I was probably about 10 years old, I went to one of the special reptile stores in Rhode Island, Providence, some of you guys know, uh, Regal Reptiles, and I had seen something about blood pythons in the uh, Reptiles magazine, and I was like, oh man, I have to check those out. So I went down there, and my first experience with the blood python was a little baby. The guys working behind the counter said, you know they're going to bite you. Okay, I'm, I'm prepared for it. Ten-year-old me standing there. So I actually picked it up out of the bin, and I was holding it, and it was actually being rather docile from what I could tell. And then all of a sudden, the thing, I'm not kidding you, it was in my hands, and it flailed. I know now that it flailed. I thought that it had just tried to bite. And it jumped probably about that far back onto the counter and then proceeded to start biting everything in the <laughs> entire area. At that point, my parents were like, okay, we have to go and scooted me out. Um, but I've been into snakes forever. This is me when I went to Dominica. My dad's from Dominica, and that is a clouded island boa that I pulled out from underneath that tree over there. Um, this is from, uh, I want to say, uh, Wild Kingdom in Orlando. And then this is also in Dominica when I went when I was a little younger. It's a, a very large caterpillar. And then this was just a few years ago. Uh, that's actually the first short tail that I'd ever gotten. And so that's just a little background on me. I've been into snakes as long as I can remember. When kids were like five years old and they were like, oh, what do you want to be? And I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a firefighter. I was like, I want to be a herpetologist. <laughs> and then all the parents were like, I don't see what herpes is. <laughs> not that. And then five-year-old me having to explain that I want to study snakes and work with them and things. So I've been into blood and short tail pythons for a little over 10 years, probably 13 years, just reading as much as I can, trying to contact people online who are also into them, working with them, uh, and just until I was able to get some. I got my first one in 2008. So I've been having, I've kept short tails for about five years, but I've been into them and actually giving advice on them through kingsnake.com forums since I was like 13, so almost 10 years now. So, if you want to go to the next one. As I was trying to tell you guys, they're not exactly the monsters of the past. Uh, blood pythons kind of have a reputation for being mean, nasty. They're going to bite you a billion times. They're going to musk all over you. Um, I've only got one short tail that I actually consider to be kind of like over the top. And that's only because it's a juvenile. I'm actually going to show you guys. Um, right now, what he'll do is if he gets agitated, usually he'll just flail his body. Kind of like that. He hasn't really bitten me yet, but he just does not like being handled. So, and this is the only one I have that will really go over the top to kind of flail and get away from you. The one that I have in here, I'm going to take him out next. He was like that the first time I got him, or when I first saw him at the vendor's table, uh, one of my friends, Jason Chapman from Hellbent Reptiles, he, uh, I pulled him out of the container and he immediately bit me about six times. I had holes all over my hand. I was like, I need him. He's <laughs> awesome. So, and then after a while, what you got to do is work with them, handle them. Uh, if you're afraid of getting bit, what I've found is that if you use some rubber dish gloves, I don't know what it is, I think it's more the, um, the they can get more traction on them, but when you're using the rubber dish gloves, they seem not to flail as much, and they're a lot more calm, you can see, you know, doing anything. And it's like night and day, you saw how he was on my hands, flailing all the time, and then as soon as you get the rubber gloves on. So if you're afraid of getting bit, and you try that out first, if you're getting into short tails, I recommend using rubber gloves. It seemed to work for a lot of people that I recommend the information to. Um, it also works for me, so you can see this guy. But um, you can see he's a lot more calm, a lot more relaxed. I think it's more of the traction they get a feel that they can grip onto something. Uh, short tails are really heavy bodied, so they're not really designed to be up in the air. Like our hands are like branches to them, so they're kind of like sit and wait predators, so they don't really spend a lot of time out and about in the trees. But you can see this is the guy that is in the top left corner right here. And when he was at that size, he was flailing everywhere. He's biting. Um, when I would take him out, you saw how the other one was flailing. He'd do that exact same thing. I started handling them. Usually, I give them about two weeks to settle in. Uh, make sure that they're eating first uh, into their cages and whatnot. And then I'll start to handle them using rubber gloves if you have to. Um, I prefer to just use hands-on. Just if you take a bite, you take a bite. It's kind of used to it. 
Uh, when they're small, it's not a big deal. When you get a big one, it's is kind of a big deal. But um, a lot of the time, people when I go to shows and things, and I ask them to look at people's blood or short tail pythons, you know it's gonna bite you, right? And then the second that you kind of show it that you're not gonna hurt it, and you uh, kind of handle it properly, support the main part of the body, that all the fear that they have is gone, and then they are completely calm and relaxed. Um, and that's the main thing when you're handling short tail pythons, you want to support as much of the body as you can. You can see that my friend over here, um, this is my friend Ken, and this is an adult female Borneo short tail python. And you can see that he's got her supported in the back end, in the middle, and then towards the front. The best thing that you want to do is support the back end of the tail and then somewhere around the middle. Uh, they kind of get a little bit claustrophobic when you grab them towards the front or the neck. So, I always suggest that when people are handling them, you always support the back end and let them go about their business in the front end. That's the business end. You don't want to be part of that. And especially when a snake gets to this size, if you spook it and try and grab it by the face, if it bites you, not only is it going to hurt, it's going to draw a lot of blood, but it'll also bruise you. I've seen lots of people that if they get bit here, they have a bruise, their whole arm. Because they, when short tails strike, you saw how that one was flailing around, they throw their whole body into it. And that's what a lot of people were afraid of initially when they started importing blood and short tail pythons is that those ones straight out of the wild were throwing their whole bodies at you. They completely lift themselves off the ground when they're in the cage to strike at you. Now that we've got captive bred short tail pythons and bloods, that's almost completely gone. And if you see it, it's mostly in the juveniles. And then as they mature, they tame out completely. You just saw the one that this little, little guy up here. And he was that size striking all over the place. Now, I could, as long as you let them know that you're coming to handle them and you're not going to feed them, they're perfectly fine. Go to the next one. And just to show you guys how far we've come, this is one of my friend uh, Tim Meads. He's got, he breeds quite a few short-tailed pythons and that's his uh, granddaughter, I want to say, uh, Andrea. And uh, that's her with one of his short tail pythons. And that snake, if it was to bite you, that would leave a significant bruise and it would probably make you bleed quite a bit. So you can see, it's all but bred out of most of the short tails in captivity now. Let's see, let's go to the next one. Alright, in captivity, uh, most people keep short tails and bloods in tubs. Uh, I recommend that when you start them off, I use the six quart uh, like shoe tubs. And those work perfect. I usually drill three or four holes on either side to get some ventilation. Uh, when people first started bringing in bloods and short tails, they're like, oh, they're swamp snakes. You need to keep them really hot and drown them in water. Just keep them soaking wet all the time. And now we've actually found out that they do a lot better with a lot less humidity. Uh, they still need about a 70 to 80% humidity in their cage. So a large water dish is really recommended. That'll keep up the humidity, and then also they can soak in it if they need to. Usually I try and get the bloods out to soak about once a week, once every two weeks. It's good for their skin. Um, but you can see that they've got quite a large water dish in each one of their cages. And then you can use a bunch of different substrates. A lot of people like to use cypress mulch. You can use care fresh paper, like the care fresh stuff that they use for small animals. Uh, that kind of gets in trouble with mold and things like that. But a lot of people use cypress, they use the ground cocoa fiber, it gets a little messy. Uh, but I usually use newspaper just because it's easy to clean. Um, if there's any problems or if they go to the bathroom, it's very easy to spot clean. Short tails, a lot of people get worried because when they buy a short tail, it won't go to the bathroom for a couple weeks, a couple months. Um, I've had some that when I bought them, they didn't go to the bathroom for five months at a time. And that's completely normal. When they're adjusting to a new area, they might not go to the bathroom or they might hold it in. Uh, a lot of times, even my regular ones, I have had these guys for years, and the ones that I feed regularly, they usually only go to the bathroom once every two to three months. But when they do go to the bathroom, it looks like you just <laughs> squeeze the roll of toothpaste out. And I guarantee that some of my big short tails can poop bigger than most retics <laughs> at probably 10 to 11 feet plus. And these guys are only six foot is the longest one that I have. Um, short tails and bloods can get up to seven feet. I know someone who's had a seven foot short tail. Um, but generally, the Sumatran short tails, the black blood pythons, uh, stay a little bit smaller. They usually stay in the 
like four to five and a half foot range. And then the Borneo short tails tend to be a lot longer than most of the rest of them. Getting up to about six foot is pretty average. Uh, males will stay about four and a half to five. And then the blood pythons <coughs> generally get about five to six foot. Doesn't really matter on the sex. And when they're at that size, they're probably going to weigh about 20, 25 to 30 pounds. And I actually brought an adult female short tail to show you guys. Just what, because when people see them at the shows and things, they see little hatchlings and they see, oh, it's a little tiny short tail, it's a little blood python. Oh man, that's adorable and I want to get that. <laughs> and then people don't realize that they can actually get into quite a hefty snake. So let me just take this girl out. And this girl is about six feet long. Why does she say she's about 20, 25 pounds? Probably closer to 25 pounds. But you can see, this is about as big as they get. They can get a little bit longer than this and a little bit thicker, but this is generally what you're looking at at an adult short tail. Go on carrying that, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see, the best way to support them is if you're going to handle them. Little head. Yeah. <laughs> a little tiny head and then a little tiny tail. You can see. But um, you can see that she's got not a huge girth, but she's still got quite a bit of girth to her. And she weighs probably between 20 and 25 pounds. And this is actually a healthy weight for her. Uh, I like to keep them a little bit thinner than this, just because it's a lot healthier for them. If you see people who have the ones that are thick and round like that, they generally are a little bit on the more 